we were talking about the distinction between the second heavens, which is where the demonic is uh, located in, within the created world, within the creations of heaven and earth, when they were removed from their place before the throne of God, these angels, fallen angels who became the demonic forces, they were placed in the second heavens where they continued to operate to manipulate the affairs of humankind, pursuing uh, the, the rule they were given through deception and subterfuge uh, in their entrapment of human beings. Then there is of course the earth, the dwelling place of man, but in the invisible realms there is the the highest heavens, which is the location of the throne of God, the the middle or the second heavens, uh, which is the location of the spiritual forces of evil. These realms are invisible. The visible world comprises of the earth and the surrounding uh, universe, they're visible. But the creatures of the invisible realm are, are allowed to sometimes come into the realm of mankind and when they do, they are invisible. Their activities will often um, generate uh, certain emotions in human beings, but by and large they remain invisible. Angels, similarly, when they come into the realm of mankind, remain invisible as well. However, there are moments when both angels and demons do become visible. For example, when Jesus was in the wilderness, Satan came and tempted him and there was an interaction between Jesus and uh, and Satan. Uh, On other occasions, uh, these spirits are discernible. When Jesus said, for example, to Peter, addressing Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So there are times when there these creatures can be visible or invisible, similarly with the angels. Uh, There are times when typically the angels are invisible, but as in the case of the angel who came to see Mary, the angel Gabriel, he greeted her uh, and and saluted her with the greeting that she was blessed amongst women. An angel similarly appeared in, in that same time frame to Zechariah, uh, the father of uh, John the Baptist, and the people also concluded that he had seen an angel. Angels appeared to Peter and John while they were in prison and, and actually led them out of the prison. So there are times when these creatures are visible, but mostly they're not. Uh, they operate from that position of invisibility. When humans die, the, the, the ones who are lost, their souls go to a place of waiting for the final judgment. Those pla- that place is referenced in Hebrew as Gehenna, which references the valley of Hinnon outside of Jerusalem where the refuse was burned and the smoke of that of that of the burning refuse went up day and night and it's analogous to the torments of uh, the souls of men who are who are in hell the greek equivalent is hades and much is said in greek mythology of the figures in greek mythology uh, who were in hades but then there is this other realm that is only referred to once by name in the scriptures, but multiple times by reference uh, in the scriptures. And that's the realm 
uh, that we touched on as we were, we were completing the last, uh, the last message. Um, and that, that is the realm known as Tartaru or Tartarus, T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. And it's analogous to the bottomless pit. And the demons, there are demons in it, or at least there are demons who are fearful of being put in it. So in Luke 8.31, when Jesus encounters the demoniac in the country of Gadara, the the demon said to him, Son of God, leave us alone. Have Have you come here to torment us before the time? And they begged him not to send them into the abyss. Instead, they requested permission to go into the, into the pigs. And of course, the pigs rushed down the slope and drowned in, uh, in the Sea of Galilee. Concerning that realm, I ended the, the last uh, session by citing 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, from the New King James and it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and there the word hell is the word Tartarus, it's the only time it appears in that way, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So Tartarus is analogous to the abyss, the abusos, the abyss, which is, which is exactly the, the scripture uh, in both Luke 8.31 and here in Revelation 9, it's the reference to that, to the abyss. The abyss is a, is a, is a term that has multiple meanings. Uh, sometimes it refers to uh, the sea and the depths of the sea as the abyss. Sometimes uh, it refers to, as we are seeing it here, the unbound, the pit or the unbounded, uh, and and then now we see it as uh, Tartarus, a place for the for the confinement of and the detaining of angelic fallen angels or demons, waiting for their judgments. The demons in the case of the man in in, uh, Gadara, uh, the demoniac of Gadara, did not want to be sent here. So it tells us that not not all fallen angels are sent here. Now as to who these particular ones are, they certainly do not include Satan and they do not include demons such as the prince of Persia. And frankly, they do not include the demon who leads the demonic forces who come out of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destroyer, and the equivalent name in Greek is Apollyon, destroyer. So the demons who are in the second heavens, some of whom uh, have been either put out at certain points awaiting for a certain command, a certain day, a certain month, a certain year, which we'll see, which is a reference with specificity to how, how God deals with some of the demons. But then there, there are angels who are bound in the abyss, and then there are angels who operate in the, these these demons rather who operate in and amongst human beings the prince of persia the prince of greece etc so we're introduced more directly into a greater understanding of what has happened to those uh, who have who resisted god who fell and who's, who are bound over until judgment, but, and, and all of those who fell are bound over until judgment. But some are in the second heaven, 
some are in the atmosphere around, over, over nations, some are amongst humankind on the earth, even possessing the bodies of human beings, and some are bound in another realm, and this realm is called the bottomless pit, and similarly referred to as uh, the lowest of the regions. And here there is no indication that it is a visible realm or even perhaps something like a black hole that would be to domesticate this. It is more a realm that is related to the power or the strength or the abilities that the creatures in those realms have vis-a-vis either the realm of man or the realm of God. So for example, we know that the creatures of the second heavens, the, the, the fallen demonic hordes in the second heavens, operating from there to manipulate the affairs of humankind as they have time, as they have opportunity and uh, as they have means, they're in a lower place than the highest heavens. But that realm vis-a-vis the earth is considered a higher realm by extension because in the book of Hebrews uh, chapters 1 and 2, the reference to that realm is that man was made, quote, a little lower than the angels. And it specifically refers to Jesus who on the earth was in a position a little lower than the angels. Because all angels were created to serve mankind, they're never higher in rank than mankind. But positionally, when you consider the advantages of invisibility over visibility, the the creatures who are invisible clearly have a distinct advantage over creatures who over human beings who deal with uh, the, the world as apprehended through the five senses. Anyway, I'm, I'm wanting to show you that in this visible and invisible realms, in the heavens, in the earth, and now in the nether world, uh, there are these distinctions that generally we typically gloss over and we don't really pay any attention to them. We, we use the word hell as a catchword to describe everything that has, everybody who has died and mostly uh, we talk about the demons in hell and uh, we somehow assume that the demons in hell are there to torture human beings when that actually is not biblically based. The the scripture that speaks of the torment of the departed souls is that which says, "For where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I don't want to go too far down this road because I want to stay close to, uh, to what we're talking about in Revelation 9. But where it speaks of the where the worm dieth not, it's the ancients had the concept of the the conscience of man being a good conscience like like, um, meat that is is ready to be eaten, but a bad conscience was viewed as like rotten meat and so maggots devouring uh, the rotten meat was the word there for where the worm dieth not which is, and where the fire is not quenched, there again it wasn't about hell fire, it was more about uh, the fires of desire. So the condition of people who die outside of Christ is that of a conscience that is devoured uh, because now they know the truth and like maggots devouring rotten meat, so the conscience of mankind is 
knows no rest and the fire there is the fire of desire. So now there's more to be said about these things but I'm wanting to to clear up enough of a path here so we could understand exactly where is this bottomless pit or what is this bottomless pit? Because it's important to understand, it's important in the understanding of the events that are proceeding at the end of the age. Now one thing we do know is that there's a final judgment and there's a final annihilation. That is referred to as quote, fire and brimstone and it's more of a reference to the Dead Sea in the ancient world where bituminous pitch uh, oozes out of the ground and uh, the Dead Sea in historical times have been known to catch fire and so it's an analogy to uh, the lake of fire where the the final destruction of both human beings and the angels, including the angels now that we're seeing coming up out of the abyss, are finally annihilated. But again, we've so conflated all of this by inexact understandings and by by the great sentimental use of uh, the, the the visuals of hell being a place of uh, humans chased by demons with pitchforks as they dodge between pits of fire, that's simply not what the Bible says. Now that isn't to suggest hell is a vacation spot, you understand? It it is a place to be avoided at all costs, please understand that. But, But in our ignorance of these things, we conflate so many things and the clarity with which we ought otherwise to see the scriptures escapes us. All right, now, so it says that this angel, this star, fell, who, that had already fallen, was given a key to Tartarus, the abyss, which is the containment of the demonic. And he opened the bottomless pit. So he was permitted to open the bottomless pit, if a location over which God has and maintains sovereign control because this is a prison for spirits, for demonic spirits. And smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke out of the pit. Now, the the bottomless pit, when it's open, smoke comes out like the smoke of a great furnace. Now, again, this is an analogy Uh, to a great furnace and a picture of smoke coming out of what is essentially an invisible realm. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke out of the pit. Clearly this is allegorical language and the, the implications are, or the meaning is, that The sun is that which is typical of the light of the day. So this is more like in in the days of mankind, in these days, mankind walks around in darkness that has come out of the abyss. Now this darkness then is metaphorical. It is not like um, a volcano erupts and spews ashes and smoke into the atmosphere. This is about how truth has fallen casualty 
to lies and deception. The, when it's like uh, the sun is darkened, there's actually a reference to this in the book of Amos, the eighth chapter, that speaks of the sun being darkened on a clear day or in, 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 in the daylight, which means that now mankind is walking in darkness. It means that nothing they believe in is reliable. Nothing they've counted on as true is sustainable. That they're deceived again and again and again to the point where there is no basis for making competent decisions. The air is dark, the sun is dark, The analogy here is to the plague of darkness in Egypt, analogous to when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and there was darkness upon the whole earth. Well, of course there would be darkness when the demonic momentarily triumphs and the Son of God is executed. Now this is not this wasn't the end of the story in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ but the darkest days of creation frankly since God called light out of darkness and caused that light to shine in the face of Jesus Christ it is as though creation reverted to the unenlightened state in which it existed prior to the calling for the enlightenment of mankind on the day Jesus was crucified. This is the analogy here, that the time had come and God had given permission for the demonic influences, the demonic spirits that were entrapped in a prison by God's design were now released and they came up in the midst of darkness or smoke or darkness like smoke out of a great furnace. The point being that mankind now was in a level of darkness unlike anything that they themselves had ever made conjured up or envisioned. You see, it's one thing to believe in a lie and to perpetuate a lie. It's another when the strength of that lie, which was always demonically based, based in deception, is now being enforced altogether by the actual demonic spirits who are behind the lies. It's as though the agents that perpetuated the lie, that fostered the lie and perpetuated it, now are in place on the earth. That's an order of deception far greater than at any other time in the history of mankind. It's where the darkness is as opaque as things may become. Now, you will notice that this also sets up a time of deception in the earth that allows for, chapter, in chapter 13, the coming forth of this global kingdom. So this is not a one-off event, it's that an environment is being set up and enforced by demonic presences that explains why human beings are so thoroughly entrapped by the demonic by the time of the rolling out of this great beast spoken of first in Daniel and then confirmed in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, which is just a few chapters ahead of where we are now. Now, So these are precursors 
is my point. As horrifying as they are, they are moving matters forward to the place where the judgments of God on uh, unregenerate mankind are taking over in this complete and near hopeless and helpless fashion. Now you'll notice that none of this, none of the seven trumpets, none of the seven bowls of God's wrath, none of them began to be poured out on the earth until until the saints were sealed, particularly those who belong to God who are yet on the earth. I will remind you that the analogy in Scripture to Egypt and the plagues is an applicable analogy. Where was Israel when the plagues were coming upon Egypt? And this is the analogy to plagues. Where was Israel? It was still in Egypt. It was in its own region of Egypt. It was in Goshen, a place, that, a place of shepherds. So, the, and, and they were behind doors, in houses, all of these things we've talked about before. They were under the rule of fathers who kept them safe because the fathers, like doors, were connected to Christ. They were hinged to Christ. So they kept them steady in the days of the plagues in Egypt while the plagues ravaged Egypt. So I want to remind you again, this is not for the believer, this is not for the sons of God, they're properly ensconced in Goshen behind doors with the blood on it uh, over which houses uh, fathers rule. So this is the time when God is releasing uh, that shaking upon the earth that now comes in the form of demonic backing, demonic empowerment. So out of the smoke, locusts came up on the earth. And these locusts, it says, were given power as the power of scorpions, they were given power on the earth. That's where I want to pick up and show the connection between scorpions and locusts. We'll talk about that when we continue.